couldn't decide on one thing. The names of my kids. My first kid, something strong. War Machine. Because who's going to pick on a kid with the name War Machine? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And if he's half as ripped as I am, the name will fit perfectly. <laughs> the next kid, I want to go with something a little bit more original. Something a little bit more out there. I'm going to name my kid a series of claps. That way I can be like, get over here! <laughs> and you know, if he's in trouble and I'm spanking him, I can go, <laughs> are you going to take the mommy's purse again? <laughs> are you? <laughs> and if I'm at the airport and I lose him or her, it's really a unisex name. All of a sudden, over the PA system over here, will the father of please report to game B5? <laughs> cell phone static. But I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. I love cell phone static. And as teenagers, you should love it too. Because the one advantage of always getting cell phone static is that if you're out some place you're not supposed to be and your parents call you, you can play that static card as much as you want. You know, you're in the car on your way to a rave at Hilke's house, it throws the sickest parties. And all of a sudden your mom calls you, you know, first thing you gotta do, you always gotta shuffle your friends. Yeah, shut up, it's my mom, it's my mom, just shut up first thing, just shut up, just shut up. Hey mom! Yeah, dinner was great. Grab that on the way home now. <laughs> and everyone always has that one really obnoxious friend who makes an out of control comment. In my case, it is always Tommy Bernard. <laughs> yeah, mom, grandma's doing great. Hey, Greg, your mom is hot. Shut up, Tommy! <laughs> oh, yeah, mom, grandma's just playing with the radio again. Crazy old woman. <laughs> oh, what's that, mom? What, where am I? Mom, shh, mom, shh. You're breaking up, she's clear. All right, guys, looks like Grandma and I are coming home tonight. So I was heading over to the cinema the other day. I was uh, with my mom and some family friends, and we were going to see Juno, which personally I thought was a great film, and I especially think that as a teenager, there's a thank you for Juno. I think that as a teenager, there's nothing better for your karma than laughing at teen pregnancy for an hour and a half. <laughs> So starts, and you know those people that are absolutely convinced that you're not going to be able to get a seat together? Well, many of you know my beautiful mother, Jill Becker. Give it up for Jill Becker. Well, she is definitely one of those people. And you know what the worst part about those people are? They are always right. How many times have you gotten to the movie theater to see that it is absolutely packed? And every time you go to the movies, it happens, and you're still surprised. You know, you walk in with a group of friends and you turn that corner and say, Whoa! Whoa! This place is packed! I mean, I guess there's two over there and you get that really awkward who's gonna sit with who. Because let's be honest, no one wants to sit with Mike because the whole movie is poking you going, What's going on? What's going on? Shut up, Mike! Just let me watch the movie! <laughs> so, while the rest of us get in, get in line for our overpriced concessions, my mom is freaking out, trying to collect enough coats to save seats. Because let's be honest, your word isn't good enough to save a seat. You better have a coat, a ticket, and a Jewish mother. <laughs> so she's coming around all this, give me your coat, give me your coat, give me your coat. Next thing you know, she's got eight coats, they're draped all over her body, she looks like a bear. She's stumbling along and gets drunk, and she disappears into the movie theater. <laughs> so you know, about 10, 15 minutes later, we have our snacks, and we walk into the movie theater, and we turn that corner, and surprise, surprise, it is packed, absolutely packed. And I just feel the eyes of everyone in the movie on me, I'm that egocentric. So, because let's be honest, when you're sitting in a movie theater, all you do is watch the people walk in and judge them. If you're a guy, the dude walking in is always a D-bag. And if you're a chick, the girl walking in is always fat. And if you're a guy, you always do that other thing that we all do, where we size them up and try to figure out if we can take them in a fight. Or if you're me, you just clutch your mace tighter. So, you know, we walk in and we turn that corner and I feel like everyone's there. I mean, before I can even make a move, I hear, I look up, there's my mom. She has half a row of covering coats. She's standing there waiting while she's trying to signal a point. Of course, now everyone in the movie theater, they're staring at me, they're laughing at me. It's just amazing how parents have the incredible ability to embarrass the Republicans and seem completely oblivious to it. 
My mom, she picked out everything I wore when I was younger. Shirt, shoes, pants, bathing suits. I didn't get out of a Speedo until I was 14. <laughs> and at that point, I was at that really awkward puberty stage where my voice was still higher than my nine-year-old sisters. I mean, it was so bad that people would call and I'd answer the phone and they'd accuse me of being my sister doing a crappy impersonation of myself. <laughs> So, I twisted my ankle trying to dodge a bee the other day. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that a flying insect can make anyone look completely retarded? <laughs> For those of you who can't exactly visualize it, let me give you a little demonstration. You know, you're walking along and all of a sudden you see this bee come at you from the corner of your eye, it whizzes out in front of you, and you get that feeling of total fear throughout your whole body, freeze up. And you think for just a second it's just gonna fly on by you and keep on going, but no. That bee just starts whizzing around you again and again. And at this point, I don't care who you are, you freak out. You go into that crazy flail like that, that's really popular in the 70s. <laughs> if you need to pull out your mace or try and spray it. <laughs> at this point, you don't even have your eyes open. For all you know, the bee could just be sitting there laughing with his friends. <laughs> because we all know the only reason the bee's bug is of their friends. <laughs> but isn't it just the greatest feeling ever when a bee's flying at you just swat it straight out of the air? Like, I just kill something a thousand with my size. Yes! I am God! <laughs> so, you get this dead bee on the ground now and everyone's always afraid to be the one who stomps on it. You know, like this tiny little stinger is going to penetrate all the way through the bottom of your shoe and stick your foot. No, I'm always the one who comes over and goes, DIE BEE! <laughs> So I was at the doctor's office the other day getting my bee sting checked out. <laughs> and uh, I recently I just made the switch from uh, a pediatrician to an adult doctor. I'm sure a lot of you are probably going to start doing that soon. And so let me give you a little piece of advice. Don't! <laughs> adult doctor's offices could be the cruelest, most unfriendly place in the entire world. There is no candy, no toys, no stickers, no blood pressure machine for you to pump, no world maps with different countries on it, no nothing. Hell, when I got my flu shot, they didn't even me a band-aid. The nurse told me to walk it off. <laughs> and it took me a while to finally make the switch. It wasn't until I was in my pediatrician's waiting room fighting over a toy fire truck with a two-year-old girl that I realized I was getting too old for this. <laughs> but the point was really hammered home when she ripped the fire truck out of my hands and I started crying. Then I realized I couldn't get away from those monsters. <laughs> Now, if I had only had my mace and I had to waste it on the bees, <laughs> that two-year-old would have gotten what was coming to him. <laughs> so, you know, the first time I'm going over to uh, my new doctor's office, my mom's with me, and of course, as I'm parking the car, she you know, grabs my coat and runs up to save me a seat. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I'm sitting in there, and I'm sitting on that paper that they roll out for you. You know, it feels like tinfoil. It crackles every time you move. And right after my doctor walked in, I made the most amazing discovery. Your doctor can say pretty much anything they want to you, and you can't get offended. So, you know, I'm sitting in there, and I've got my shirt off, and it's pretty well known. I'm a thin guy. So, you know, the doctor opens the door, and he walks in, he takes one look at me, and he goes, Geez, Greg, have you ever heard of eating, you twin? <laughs> now, for how infrequently you see your doctor, it's pretty amazing that we, the general public, accept the insults that they so freely keep upon us. But no, I don't take that. My doctor drops a bomb on me, I'm right back in his face. Hey, you know I have more hair on my ass than you have on your head. <laughs> so, it's true. So, I mean, if you had a friend that you only saw once or twice a year, and the first time you saw them in a while, the first thing that comes out of their mouth was, geez, Greg, I never realized you had less muscle tone than a newborn child. <laughs> Would you take it? Now imagine for a second if you talk to your girlfriend the same way that your doctor talked to you. She gets out of the shower. That's right, I just joke I live with my girlfriend, and all I do is sit and watch her get out of the shower. Yeah. <laughs> you know, ugh, that's a really ugly rash you got over your neck. It really brings you down from like a nine to a, about a six. And then she breaks up with me because I didn't call her a 10. But it's okay, because I know somewhere my mom is saving me a seat. Thank you guys very much. Yeah.